This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at United Presbyterian Church. It is good to see you all. And a special welcome to those who are joining us via live stream. If you're visiting with us this morning, there should be a green welcome folder in the pew pocket in front of you. On the right-hand side of the pocket, or on the inside, in the right-hand pocket, is information about what happens here during the week. On the left-hand side, there's a card that you can fill out and place on the offering plate later so that we can stay in touch with you. I have a few announcements to point out. Um, let me turn this over. Uh, first, that today is our last day receiving the disaster kit donations, um, the gifts from the heart. You'll see that list there. Um, on October 30th, we will be putting those together as part of our um, Trunk or Treat and Celebration Sunday. Um, following worship, we will put those together. We'll have lunch together. The kids will put on their Halloween costumes and Trunk or Treat in the parking lot. It'll be just a fun time all around for all of us. I hope you'll all join us. Um, you know, and grown-ups, if you want to bring a costume and put it on after lunch too, you are welcome to do so. A um, couple other things, the fall spruce up is uh, next Sunday. Um, uh, we're still looking for folks to sign up to help do those spruce ups. And if you are um, someone in need of some help, um, the kind of projects that um, folks are willing to come do, all those details are listed there. Um, and you can contact Nikki um, for more information about that. You'll see information about the circles that are meeting this week. Um, and I think those are the things I wanted to point out this morning. Please stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship. We say we come to worship to be with God. But the beautiful truth is God is already with us. God is always with us. So in this time together... Let us lift our voices in praise of this loving, ever-present God. Mm -hmm. 
When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in Please join me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, you are all light and wonder and glory. You are our strength and our delight. You give us all we need to live. Yet we are distracted by all that glitters, continually grasping for more. Rather than trust your provision, we chase after our own happiness. Forgive us, Lord, and turn us back to you. Overwhelm us with your goodness and cover us with grace, for we know that you are the source of life, the fount of all that is good. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
You may be seated, and the children may come join me. No, I see um, Kai's coming. Is Dax hiding out? Yeah. Carter and Tyler are coming. We got a house full today. This is fantastic. Come on up and have a seat with me. Oh my gosh, you're getting huge. Hey, it's great to see you, little guy. So I'm not Miss Michelle, right? Miss Michelle couldn't be here today because her brother, who lives in Cheyenne, had a stroke last night. And so he's in the hospital, and she's headed there this morning. So it made me think that maybe, you know, we all have uh, friends or family members um, who have difficulties, and we worry, right, when that happens. Um, we might be afraid for them. And I think that's probably true for Miss Michelle today. So I thought the best thing we could do is to pray for her. And then I have some paper so that, you know, during the sermon, if you um, want to draw her a picture or write her a note, and you can give it to me on the way out, I'll put them on her desk, and then they'll be there when she um, comes back into the office sometime. But what we do know is that when um, hard things happen and bad things happen or people get sick, that God is always with us and that there is nothing, nothing that can ever separate us from God's love. So let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful for how much you love and care for us and that even when we're afraid, and even when we're worried, you are with us. And so we pray for Miss Michelle, we pray for her brother and their family, that you would surround them with your love and care, and that they would know your peace during this time. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Anybody want some paper? Is that for Dax because he's hiding out? Would you like some paper? You, yeah, okay. You can take it to her. All right. Well, thanks, guys. And so that means there's no children's chapel today either. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Today we move from the book of Exodus to the book of Joshua, a full generation after the exodus from Egypt and the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, a full generation of wandering in the wilderness before entering the promised land. Joshua makes a turning point in the narratives of the Old Testament. It recounts the transition of the Israelites as landless wanderers into the landed people of Israel. In the process, it depicts a glorious entry into the promised land with the virtually unhindered conquest of vast portions under the leadership of Joshua, the successor of Moses. Today's reading is Joshua's final address to the people before his death. And here he reviews their history and challenges them to be faithful to God. Let us listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today in Joshua chapter 24. 
Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst. And afterward, I brought you out. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterward, you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I handed them over to you, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he blessed you, so I rescued you out of his hand. When you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, as well as the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I handed them over to you. I sent swarms of hornets ahead of you that drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive yards that you did not plant. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served before the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Choose this day whom you will serve. How would you answer? I imagine that most, if not all of you, would answer like Joshua. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But do our actions truly bear that out? I would argue that the two resources we most value are time and money. And how we use these point to what is most important to us. If you were to look back over your calendar and checkbook or credit card statement, it would show you how you spend your two most valuable resources. It would show you what you truly serve, regardless of what you might say. It's a revealing exercise, and I would encourage you to try it. 
A record of what you value is right there in front of you, in black and white. Now, while we don't literally gather up carved images of other gods, like the Israelites were doing, it's easy to absorb the values that surround us without reflection. And then over time, it is easy for what we say we value and where we place our time and money to no longer be aligned. This challenge laid down by Joshua to remember God's acts in our lifetime and long before and consider our commitment in light of that is a useful reflective practice if we want to live lives of authenticity and intention. This practice is the foundation of our stewardship emphasis every year. And while we talk about the financial needs of UPC and ask for your participation and support, it is really an annual spiritual practice, an opportunity for each one of us, each household, to reflect on what we most value and consider if we've given ourselves to it wholeheartedly. When Joshua puts this challenge to the Israelites, they respond not just as individuals or households, but also as a people. Together, they have a purpose that is larger than each individual. When they choose to reject the other gods and recommit to serving the Lord, they recommit themselves to the covenant to be God's people, to be God's agents of wholeness and blessing in the world, to be the ones who remake the earth. Something that is larger than each one individually. The power of wholehearted commitment and the whole being greater than the sum of its parts is illustrated in the story of the Olympic rowing team of 1936. It's beautifully told by Daniel James Brown in his book, The Boys in the Boat, Nine Americans and Their Epic Quest for Gold at the 1936 Olympics. It is the story of nine working-class boys from the University of Washington, raised in the depths of the Great Depression. Without any rowing experience, they forged a team and raced against the elite rowing teams from the East and West Coasts and won a spot to represent the U.S. in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, shocking the world by challenging the German boat rowing for Adolf Hitler. I know nothing about rowing. How hard can it be? You pick up the oars and you row, right? Maybe not. Physiologists have calculated that rowing a 2,000-meter race, the Olympic standard, takes the same physiological toll as two back-to-back -back basketball games in about six minutes. The movements of each rower have to be so intimately intertwined, so precisely synchronized with the movements of the others, that any one rower's mistake can throw off the tempo of the stroke, balance of the boat, and ultimately the success of the whole crew. They say it is maddeningly, maddeningly difficult. It is as if eight men, standing on a floating log that threatens to roll over whenever they move, have to hit eight golf balls at exactly the same moment, with exactly the same amount of force, directing the ball to exactly the same point on a green, and doing so over and over every two or three seconds. This may sound like all eight rowers are identical. While they are completely synchronized and rowing as one, each seat in the boat is unique, 
and each has its own specific purpose. Some people are made for specific seats. They're not identical, but they are a team. Brown's telling of the story revolves around Joe Rance. Joe is raised in such poverty and in such a dysfunctional home that he essentially raises himself. He is independent and self-reliant to his core. Joe is utterly committed to keeping his place in the boat. And so the coach continues to try him in different positions, but there's something that's missing. Joe was working so hard, but as an individual, not for the team as a whole. He hadn't given himself over to the team. He needed to trust them. George Yeoman Pocock, one of the wisest people in the world of rowing, also built the boats for the University of Washington. And he says, where is the spiritual value of rowing? The losing of self entirely to the cooperative effort of the crew as a whole. During this time that Joe is struggling, George pulls him aside and explains to him, the craft of building a boat is like a religion. It isn't enough to master the technical details of it. You have to give yourself up to it spiritually. You have to surrender yourself absolutely to it. When you're done and walk away from the boat, you have to feel that you have left a piece of yourself behind in it forever, a bit of your heart. Without Joe's total commitment, the boat was missing what rowers call swing. It's not just that the oars enter and leave the water at precisely the same instant. Sixteen arms must begin to pull. Sixteen knees must begin to fold and unfold. Eight bodies must begin to slide forward and backward. Eight backs must bend and straighten all at once. Each minute action, each subtle turning of the wrists, must be mirrored exactly by each oarsman from one end of the boat to the other. Rowing that becomes a kind of perfect language. Poetry. That's what a good swing feels like. Swing comes from the losing of self entirely to the cooperative effort of the crew as a whole. When Joe was able to give himself over to the team, when they found their swing, their boat was unbeatable. What would swing look like here at UPC? to be part of something bigger that we are ready to give ourselves over to, to commit ourselves to, to surrender ourselves absolutely to, so that when we walk away from this boat, we have left a piece of ourselves in it. People are part of church communities for lots of reasons. They belong and attend for a variety of individual reasons. For some, this is where they belong. Their fundamental, deep, and abiding friendships are here. For others, this is a place where they can express their gifts and passions in a genuine and authentic way. Behind the organ, in the sound booth, singing in the choir or praise band, teaching a table full of children at Logos visiting the sick and the homebound, caring for our building and resources, or doing justice by caring for our neighbors in need. At some level, we are all individuals that have individual reasons for being here. 
But what if the church is fundamentally something larger than a collection of individuals and the individual things that are important to them? What would it look like if we gave ourselves over wholeheartedly to something larger? Might we find our swing? Over the next two weeks, as we prayerfully consider our support of the ministry of UPC in 2023, don't think of it as simply fundraising. Take some time to reflect on Joshua's challenge, who and what you truly serve, and to what and to whom you are willing to give yourself wholeheartedly. How will you and your household answer authentically? To the glory of God, our Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer. Amen. With gratitude for God's faithfulness and with thanksgiving for all that we have received, let us bring our gifts to God. Let us pray. O oh God, with faith and hope, we offer these gifts, symbols of what we truly value. Use them, even as you use us, to accomplish your purposes in Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the Lord of our lives. Amen.
Let us continue in prayer. Merciful God, powerful and wonderful, eternally present and graciously close, we are grateful for what you have given us in Jesus Christ. Life and love without end. Prompted by your spirit and encouraged by your faithfulness, we lift to you the cares and concerns of our hearts, the burdens and the worries of our lives. We pray that the sick would be healed, that the broken would be mended, that the mournful would be comforted. We pray that warriors would yield to peace, that leaders would gain wisdom, that the forsaken would be gathered in. We pray that the sorrowful would be consoled, that the poor would be lifted up, that the anxious would be released. We pray for children in their growing and for youth in their seeking. We pray for those making new starts and for those nearing a journey's end. We pray for those facing hard choices and for those enduring painful consequences. We pray for those filled with bitterness and for those who are just empty. We pray that your church might claim its potential, that the body of Christ might be strengthened by its many parts, that the work of ministry might be done with joy and thanksgiving. We pray for the courage to follow Jesus wholeheartedly and authentically, for the faith to trust your promises to us, for the vision to see your kingdom among us even now. All of these things we pray in the name of the one who ceaselessly is praying for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please stand. Not the only one who feels like this Feeling like you lose more than you win Like life is just an endless hill You climb, you try and try But never arrive I'm telling you something is racing this running Oh, you're working way too hard And this perfection you're chasing is just there
go out into the world as God's beloved children, serving the Lord wholeheartedly. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.